Okay, it's last call. <laughs> if everybody could come in and take their seats, please, that would be great. Good evening, and welcome to the Center for Strategic International Studies. Uh, I'm Andrew Schwartz, and I work here in external relations. Um, when the summer began, I remember telling one of our uh, new interns that they shouldn't be upset if things slow down a little bit in the summer, um, you know, because not much happens in the summer in D.C. or in the world. But needless to say, events around the world have intervened to make their summer a much more productive one, and today is certainly no exception. Um, thank you for joining us tonight uh, for what was supposed to be a very timely discussion on Iraq, Syria, ISIS, or IS, or ISIL, uh, and the future of the Middle East, which I'm sure now will expand to include some of today's breaking news stories. Uh, I'm also sorry to inform you that CNN's Elise Labbitt won't be able to join us tonight because of the multitude of uh, breaking news stories that are transpiring, but the good news is we've got CSIS's Heather Conley, uh, and we're going to talk through some of these great issues and what's going on. Um, I'd like to wa welcome uh, Bob Schieffer, who has been so amazing. Uh, we've done over 50 of these together, um, and I, Bob is, is just, you know, our our partner in this, and we thank him so much. And we thank the Schieffer School, the Schieffer College of Communication at TCU. Um, I hope everybody's wearing their purple. If you come to future Schieffer series, you have to wear purple because that's the color of the horn frogs. Um, we're very appreciative of our, our colleagues down at TCU. Um, and of course, none of this would, uh, none of these discussions would be possible without the generosity and support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, whose commitment to CSIS is really unwavering. And I'd like to uh, uh, welcome my friend Vasily, who's here from the foundation, and thank you, Vasily, for all of your support and all of your, your help over the years. Um, we also have the, uh, the Iraqi ambassadors here tonight, uh, and I'd like to welcome him as well. Um, with that, ladies and gentlemen, please join uh, me in welcoming Bob Schieffer. Thank you all, and <clears throat> thank you for coming. Where is the Iraqi ambassador? I'm sorry, I, had, I didn't see him come in. Mm. Right there, Mr. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Ambassador. Glad to have you. Uh, let's, uh, I want to just uh, introduce the panel, and it's really good. Kathleen Hicks, uh, Senior Vice President, the Kissinger Chair uh, here at CSIS, Director of the International Security Program, uh, veteran diplomat, scholar, all of the above, and uh, Dr. Hicks, glad to have you. Uh, Dr. Kimberly Kagan is the founder and president of the Institute for the uh, Study of War Affairs. Uh, she is a military historian. She has taught at the Academy at West Point, at Yale, Georgetown, American, author of The Eye of Command and The uh, Surge, a military history. Uh, she spent time uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. How long were you there? 15 months. 15 months. And uh, also, then, of course, uh, down at this end, our, our good friend, uh, and who's filling in today because the CNN reporter, Elise, uh, couldn't, uh, uh, could not uh, show up, and uh, that is Heather Connolly, who is developer, uh, I mean, director uh, of the uh, Europe section here at CSIS. So we've got and is also a veteran uh, diplomat uh, and scholar. We have uh, a lot of expertise here, and, and so we'll just get right to it. This was supposed to be about ISIS. What is ISIS? What is happening in Iraq? Uh, but with all that's happening today, uh, I thought we, we needed to broaden this. Number, uh, the second thing that's happened today is the Israelis have, as they said they would have to do, have launched the uh, ground invasion uh, into Gaza. Uh, that began uh, just as we were uh, assembling here. And then earlier today, I'm sure most of you uh, have heard uh, about the uh, plane that was shot down over Ukraine. Uh, Heather, do you have any late information about the yeah. plane? Well, we're, uh, right now it's really focusing on uh, the missile that, uh, the anti-aircraft missile that brought down the aircraft. Uh, obviously, all sides are denying uh, who was responsible. There, there's a sense of reports, and again, this is right now, it's speculation we don't know, but there seems to be pointing to last month 
um, the pro-Russian separatists had uh, overtaken a Ukrainian military installation where there actually were some photographs of these Buk missiles that were there. So there is a sense that uh, uh, the separatists uh, had in possession missiles that had the range to bring down that aircraft. Interestingly, some of these uh, Facebook postings that the separatists had, had done have been taken down very quickly. It sort of led a trail. Again, this is speculation. Uh, interestingly, right as it appeared, the story was breaking that the aircraft had been shot down, President Putin and President Obama spoke. Uh, this was at President Putin's initiative to talk about the sanctions that were, uh, were announced yesterday. And so uh, we understand they did speak a little bit, or at least informed about the aircraft. Um, right now, obviously, uh, we're trying to understand and uh, our hearts go out to the families of this unbelievable tragedy, how many Americans are aboard. We know there are substantial numbers of, of Europeans because the, the flight uh, originated uh, in Amsterdam. This is an unspeakable tragedy. And it speaks to me of the consequences of when you allow a conflict, and this is, I think, going to be the story as you talk about the Middle East, you allow a conflict to escalate to a point where it becomes it's out of control and the unintended consequences of what happened today. So this is going to be a major story. The investigators, we hope they can get on the ground. The plane uh, fell in rebel-controlled territory, so this is going to be very difficult. But uh, hopefully this is the wake-up call to have Putin really begin to rein in these uh, separatists. But quite frankly, it's unclear whether he's able to at this point. And that's well, really quite the, the contrary. As I understand right. it, he has now put out a statement. Oh, he has. And he said it is all the fault of Ukraine because it happened over their territory. <laughs> and he says uh, it would not have happened had they not rearmed. Again, we've had four Ukrainian aircraft shot down, two military transport planes, a jet fighter just this morning. It's unclear to me that the Ukrainian government actually controls its airspace. Uh, so I think, again, both sides are going to argue that, you know, denying the responsibility. But uh, we'll let the investigators hopefully do their work. Uh, but again, between the sanctions and if Putin does not take clear steps, to de-escalate this. I, I think we're, we're now entering a very new phase. Uh, this is going to be concentrated urban warfare, potentially in Donetsk and Luhansk, and, and this is going to get more serious, potentially. Uh, one thing, I, I think uh, both, uh, well, I think everybody is now reporting and quoting sources out of the Pentagon that the plane was indeed shot down. There was uh, some question and speculation about that. Uh, nobody has yet decided who fired the missile, right. although uh, there's every indication that it, it came from, from these rebels. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was one report being put out by the Ukraine government, uh, just as I was coming here, that they had heard uh, the rebel, uh, somebody on the rebel side talking, they claimed, to Russian intelligence and admitting they had shot mm -hmm. it down. Mm -hmm. but it seemed to be suggesting that they thought they had shot down a military plane, that maybe this was do you know anything about anything? No, I heard Kathleen? exactly the same reporting, and Heather's been tracking this more closely today. Um, but but the same, which is that there they had some belief that it was a military aircraft. That that's a little hard to believe given the, the difference in signature and the altitude. But uh, I think as as Heather said, it's too early to really speculate too much on exactly how this happened and how intentional it was in terms of it being an air, uh, excuse me, an airliner as opposed to a military craft. It really does underline, though, the uncertainties when these things start rolling down the track and the next thing you know, it's something totally out of control, as we have seen happen um, in Israel during this latest Absolutely. episode. Absolutely. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about Israel because we now know uh, that uh, Israel has decided to launch the ground uh, invasion uh, there were more than 100 rockets fired out of Gaza into Israel after the ceasefire uh, ended this morning. Israel had said uh, they had hoped and at one point had announced yesterday, I believe it was, that they had actually uh, agreed to a ceasefire that would start sometime tomorrow. Uh, but then uh, that, that quickly that quickly fell apart, and once this uh, this brief uh, ceasefire this morning was over, 
uh, they were uh, bombarded again by, by rockets from the Gaza. And Netanyahu had said, if there is more violence after this ceasefire, we'll probably have to go in. And so they have cleared the way. What do you see happening here? Right, I think the key question for the United States and the broader region right now is how surgical is this ground invasion? How much is it? Early reports are that they're focused on these tunnels that are coming in under the fence line um, from Gaza into Israel. Um, if it's limited to that and it's short duration, that's one set of outcomes that I think the United States will continue to stress the importance of no civilian casualties, where, where the administration's been very clear about its disappointment, horror, et cetera, about the, the killing of um, children in particular in, in Gaza, but, and the need for Israel to be surgical. But the United States' overall message is defense of Israel is, is critical and um, important. So I think if that's one scenario, and I think it's the most plausible scenario. What we don't know yet is if the Israeli ground invasion goes beyond that and starts to have a, a much more significant effect on the entire region's politics, essentially, um, which would not be helpful right now. But again, the United States stand behind the defense of Israel, and so there'll have to be a conversation about what Israel believes it needs if it tries to go beyond that point, how much of that is necessitated by the immediate attacks from Hamas, the, the, the ones most recently. Heather, do you think there's any chance, uh, we know that uh, President Abbas apparently is in Cairo, yeah. along with uh, other people in the Palestinian uh, Authority. Uh, apparently there are some people from Hamas that are there. Do you think there is any chance that uh, anything can come of those talks there? Well, I think, again, the Egyptian role here has been critical, has traditionally been critical. We were hoping that that ceasefire, that initial ceasefire, that, which the Israelis uh, accepted, and unfortunately uh, how it was responded to by Hamas was more rockets into Israel, that we can, they can see that now, this is, a, again, according to reports, air, sea, land, uh, the electricity has been cut off from Gaza City. This is a serious incursion. We don't know the length of time, and so I, I think it would behoove uh, the, uh, the, the Palestinian Authority to certainly try to see where they can stop this quickly and get back to the table immediately. I think, again, to Kath's point, we'll have to see, uh, in fact, how far the Israelis are going to, to take this. And again, world opinion here. We, we know, again, from uh, Europeans, we're trying to see how they could uh, offer their uh, good, good offices and, and trying to get a return back to the negotiating table. But uh, I think this is going to be a, yet another area where we're going to have to work very closely well, let's bring this on. now uh, to what uh, we originally came here to talk about, and that is Iraq and what's going to happen there. Dr. Kagan, what do you, do you see any of all of what we've been talking about here impacting on what's happening in Iraq? Uh, I do see that there is a trend in our discussions about uh, Russia and Ukraine and in our discussions about uh, Iraq, Syria, indeed the wider region. Uh, there are states and non-state actors that are actively seeking to shift the borders, uh, the state borders that have come into existence and uh, grown over the course of the 20th century. Uh, what we're seeing inside of Iraq, in the Islamic State of Iraq and Sham, now self-declared as an Islamic caliphate, uh, is a force, an organization, a military organization that has organized itself uh, with, into an army uh, that has capabilities to fight hybrid warfare, like a terrorist group, like an army, uh, and shift between those two capabilities. Why is it doing this? What are its strategic objectives? Well, to break down the state system uh, for at least six months and uh, possibly longer than that, ISIS has been running a Twitter campaign, hashtags sykes -Pico. Why? Because, in fact, redrawing the boundaries of the Middle East is at the top of their strategic priority list because it is in redrawing those boundaries that it can create the kinds of political vacuums in which the Islamic Caliphate can and may be able to flourish. 
So as we look at separatist movements sponsored perhaps by other states uh, in Europe, um, as we look at what is happening in the Middle East, I think that we're looking at our fundamental world order changing. And we need to have the strategic imagination and vision to project that ahead and understand what that means for each and every one of us. You agree with that, Dr. Hicks? Yeah, I largely agree with that. I think um, uh, the, the United States, the crux of the problem with the United States right now, the real paradox for Americans is their domestic interests at home that are very important. We have an almost endless list of woes in the world. We've, we've just gone through today. You know, it took us 15 minutes just to get through, if you will, today. And every day there's more that loads on. And it's, it's, it's more than we can bear as a single nation. Um, and we risk overstretch if we try to take on everything everywhere. The paradox is you can't then swing the other way. And it takes this careful calibration of power in all its elements to include hard power, to figure out where to act and how. And I completely agree um, with Kim that if you leave the Middle East to its own devices at this point, you very much risk the growth of these ungoverned areas, of which there are, there are some already, but the growth of them. Um, you risk credibility issues. Um, we certainly saw that with uh, Syria and the continuation of the humanitarian crisis in Syria now overspilling into all the rest of the region with, the, with Iraq being most notable um, in terms of its immediate and profound effect, but not the last place where this could happen. To be clear, Jordan is a, a significant worry for us. So I think for the United States, the real challenge is how do you calibrate all this? And that's where it becomes important to hone those tools that we have, to not think every um, discussion about engaging in the region means that we're talking about a large-scale American ground incursion or uh, ground force. And I, for one, think the administration on Iraq proper now at this point has been responsible to date in thinking through how to begin to, to engage the Iraqi government on the political side and on the security assistance side uh, to develop a program and way ahead. The problem is it doesn't end at the borders of Iraq, and that's where we need a broader regional strategy, and that's really the challenge today. What is our strategy? Hmm. Where and uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> I, that's a great question. I, I, I love, Kim, your, your point, uh, you, you mentioned about Sykes-Picot, so that, that colonial British-French agreement of how the Middle East would be carved up. It's ironic to me, this is the 100th anniversary of, of the World First World War. War. And uh, any if you've not read uh, Professor Christopher Clark's Sleepwalkers book, uh, in, in some ways, are we just sleepwalking into it? We can watch as these events yes. unfold, but we feel like we can't influence them. We can't control them. Or maybe our influence and our role is counterproductive to what is going on. And I, I think we've just, we're really ending this era, and this is what, in some ways, President Putin is telling us. He did, he's basically refuted the post-Cold War order. He said, nah, -uh. that's, I, that was the greatest catastrophe. That's not my order. And we're seeing this regionally, this profound challenge. We're going back to balance of power, where there's not a unipolar power of the United States. There, there's even the bipolar era of the Cold War where two powers and you could sort of isolate and contain these regional. Now there are regional powers with a multitude of agendas and influence, non-state actors. We see in Ukraine hybrid warfare where people take off insignia. They're trying to have deniable plausibility. This isn't me. Oh, you're confused. You can't prove that. Where is the United Nations Security Council in all of this? Our institutions are failing because they're not well equipped for this balance of power, regional dynamic, and I would argue, quite frankly, US diplomacy and the whole t a range of tools in the toolkit, we aren't geared for this. We, the unipolar, will we'll deal with this conflict. This is today's message. This is today's theme. Well, when you've got five, six regional crises d that demand strong diplomacy, that demand all the tools of state, we feel like we can't catch up. We can't engage in that. So I would say we need to start decentralizing, and this would be my message to, to the White House. You can't have a small group of people. They can't manage all of these crises. You need to empower 
your talented diplomats, your, your, and bring in the private sector has a piece of this, the non-governmental, the civil society, and we have to be much smarter, much more adept at these regional challenges. And right now, I feel like we're, 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 we're clumsy, we're, we're catching up, we're reactive, and that is where it feels like, where's the U.S., where's the strategy? We're playing catch up. Well, it does would certainly appear so, I mean, as we watch. But I think you bring up a very interesting point here, and that is, is there too much of the power, too much of the decision making now centered in the White House, and it, should some of that be delegated out into the, into the bureaucracy? I mean, uh, should the State Department be playing a bigger role here than it's playing? Should the Defense Department be playing a bigger role? Well, I, I think what, you know, when we feel like things are out of control, it's a human instinct to sort of grab it and say, oh, I'm going to control it. I'm going to do message control. It's going to be how I want it. And I think what we're seeing, again, this is social media. When I'm watching today's events in, in Ukraine, I'm getting, I'm getting Twitter feeds. I mean, this is, they're laughing government response. They are, which is going too far ahead of it. How are we in this dynamic information age able to get messages out? And so the instinct is, well, I'm going to control it, so I'm going to have have a few people control that message. In some ways, you have to let go, and you have to say, look, we have very talented diplomats that are in the field. We have a lot of instruments of influence and power. We've got to let go and allow them to engage and not be afraid. They may make mistakes, but right now, we're trying to control it and constrict it, and we're not able, I think, to take opportunities of when situations begin to evolve in the regions, we can nip them early and not have them go into full What, what should our strategy be, Kim? I, I really think that uh, the United States has vital national security interests in uh, the Middle East uh, that include, actually, the preservation of states in the Middle East. Uh, we haven't really gotten, um, or we haven't really had to say that uh, for an awfully long time, but it is a core interest of the United States to maintain the state system as it is. It suits us. This world order suits us. Uh, it is changing, however, in ways that are not conducive to U.S. national interests. I believe that uh, the, the United States is struggling actually not only to control a message, but to control the environment around it, or to try to shield itself from having to make decisions in an environment that is rapidly changing. In truth, uh, the environment will continue to change rapidly and will deteriorate without US leadership. What does the United States actually need to do? Uh, well, for one thing, the United States actually does have to decide that it is a problem for there to be an Islamic state in the Middle East. Uh, we probably ought to have decided that uh, back in 2012 or 2013, uh, but that doesn't matter. We cannot actually hit the strategic pause button and then the strategic rewind button and go back and face those decisions. What do we do now? Well, first, uh, we do have many instruments of power that need to be brought to bear. They are diplomatic, they are military, and they also include engagement, uh, not only with the government of Iraq, which is, of course, important, but with the tribes and the people of Iraq, and with the uh, moderate opposition inside of Syria, which is the only bulwark uh, that now exists um, between ISIS and, uh, and really having an Islamic state that goes, uh, frankly, from almost Baghdad all the way over uh, to, um, well, today, actually, uh, ISIS took over an oil field near Palmyra in Holmes province. Uh, and I think that they mean uh, to go down to Jordan. And I think that they mean to attack Saudi Arabia. Okay, that is the kind of perspective that we need. And we still have a chance to nip in the bud those further attacks, those further assaults on the state system that are coming. So you paint a very dangerous situation. Well, I, I, let me just add, um, I just think it's important without in any way defending the actions of the United States and its foreign policy overall to date, there is a lot of blame to go around. 
um, on the Middle East. And so I think that's yes. worth saying. And, and, and thus, the solution, obviously, is not a US solution. It can't be. We, again, we don't have the resources. But more importantly, probably, we don't have the tools. And to Heather's point about the regionalization of foreign policy, I, I agree with that fundamentally. But, but I think the key piece of that is what's going on in different regions varies. And so in a place like Asia, where our traditional tool set, hard power, economic statecraft, state-based ways of dealing with issues is still very applicable, the Middle East is a whole other ballgame. So it's important to acknowledge that when it comes to Iraq, Iraq itself bears a lot of responsibility, but so do the Gulf states, Turkey, um, the US, Russia, Iran, I could go on. Um, and of course, the, the terrorists themselves, uh, ISIL, ISIS, the Islamic State itself, um, and Syria. So there are a lot of parties that have to be brought to the table here to make a good solution and way forward. I think it was a positive sign that the US met today with the Iranians. I don't know if that progressed in any way, but the fact that there was at least a conversation acknowledges the reality that it's not just Iran, but there are a lot of parties that have to be brought to the table. But fundamental to that, and where I agree with these two, is US leadership is critical to that. It is unfortunate for many Americans that it's required, but we, shouldn't, we, should ha we have to acknowledge that it's required. Um, even if there are limits to what we can do with it alone. Do the three of you agree that an Islamist state, such as you're describing, ruled over by ISIS, uh, in that particular place where it is, between, between Baghdad and, and Damascus, does that pose a direct threat to the U.S. national security? I would say so. Uh, certainly over the intermediate term. One of the things that the Islamic State is actively doing is recruiting English speakers uh, from the United States, from Canada, uh, from Australia, uh, and other places in the world. Um, I think that what we have seen develop, uh, especially since January of 2014, when the Islamic State actually took over uh, the city of Raqqa uh, in Syria in a way that was uncontested, uh, is the creation of a model sanctuary uh, that has a, an element of its military power, an element of its civic power, and an element of its religious authority that it is trying to test. Raqqa is a center, a hub, to which the Islamic State has been recruiting uh, foreign fighters uh, from around the world, has explicitly asked them to immigrate to there. Uh, and the continued publication of magazines in English aimed at an English language audience that uh, publications such as one uh, recently released called Dabiq, which is about the place where Armageddon will come between Iraq and Syria. Um, I certainly think that we might want to take them seriously a bit uh, in their intention actually to bring a conflict uh, that will harm uh, directly US national security interests and will do so in part by recruiting um, English speakers and Americans uh, for future conflict. Heather, what do we do about it? Well, I could not agree more. And this, the foreign fighter question uh, is, is absolutely paramount. We're seeing where European uh, foreign fighters are they are learning, they are returning back to the communities. This is not going to be contained, even though uh, to many Americans, this is far away in, in the Middle East. And if they're just killing one another, that's, you know, what, what does it have to do with us? We don't need to be involved in that. This will come home to us. I think Eric Holder and others have been very explicit in that. That is the challenge. Bob, your question of what we do about it, uh, it this is where we're running out of options, I think, very, very quickly. Um, and how do you contain it? When we have ISIS taking over major refineries, they're going to have the economic tools. When they seek funding, it's no longer now, you know, for us stopping the banks and terrorism financing, they just rob the banks. They take okay. over the banks. How do you stop this? And again, is to Kath's point, regionally, we don't, we have states in the region working opposite sides of this problem. It's going to be incredibly difficult. This is where it's going to take uh, an enormous amount of American time and attention when other issues in the world are uh, getting our attention, Afghanistan, Asia, Ukraine, 
uh, Nigeria, the Sahel, we can keep going on here, and focus and try to bring a coalition together to try to prevent work with moderate Sunnis that do not want to be under ISIS and try in some ways, like the, uh, the awakening that yes. we did many, to work locally, they don't want this, but it was so much better than obviously what they perceived that was coming from Baghdad, which is such a, an extraordinary statement. We have to get involved, but we have to fundamentally believe that America has a positive yes. role to play here. And I think in some ways in our own mind, we don't think we have a positive role to play well, because of Iraq, because of our experience uh, in 2003. Do you think there's a perception in that part of the world that we are somehow stepping back, that we are oh, withdrawing? Oh, there is absolutely a perception, particularly, I would say, in the Gulf, I think in the Levant. Well, Syrians, I think, would certainly tell you that they're, they're, un, un, they're not unhappy with America's response. I think the Jordanians, we work very hard, and the Lebanese, and certainly the Israelis, we work very hard to try to reassure. But it's a, it is a message that is failing. Um, you know, the Syrian crisis, if the de facto U.S. policy was to contain the Syria crisis, we, that has failed. Um, and that was essentially the, at least the unspoken strategy. So the pieces, putting, putting the pieces back together again involves everything that Heather just mentioned on the Iraqi side, U.S.-Iraqi side. It involves fundamentally the governance of Iraq. I mean, at its core, it's about strengthening the capability of Iraq to govern itself in a way that is um, pluralistic and is inclusive to the point where you can let the security institutions um, be respected and invested in the future of the country. But it's also about that training and equipping on the Syrian side because you've got to get an end to the Syrian crisis. And an end, at this point, I think the only realistic near-term end is just a ceasefire that allows some amount of um, humanitarian assistance to get in. Uh, I think the goals have to be very modest, but we have to put some effort there. The president's indicated we're going to put effort there, but we need to start seeing those results. And, and what happens uh, if the Iraqi government, and I hope to ask the, uh, well, let me just ask the uh, ambassador right now. Mr. Absolutely. Ambassador. Absolutely, we have a party here. <laughs> you're here. What's the latest news from Iraq? Is there, is there a chance that this government can uh, do the kinds of things that the U.S. government is urging right now, and that is to be a more inclusive uh, government and uh, where, where do you think all that is right now? Uh, thank you very much, Bob, for giving me the opportunity. Well, uh, we recently had the election. 60% uh, of the people participated. In worst areas of Ambar, 40% participated. And it was considered as a fair election by all standards. However, the situation has changed on the ground. What we have recently was the Speaker of the Parliament, which was a major handle or hurdle which was passed. Uh, we anticipate by tomorrow a nominee for the presidency will be within the Kurdish uh, bloc. And within four weeks or so after that, the premiership. So where, where previously it took six months and then nine months, now it looks like within six weeks or so. So in a way, there's a, a great deal of momentum being created by all the parties to formation, for the formation of the government. As to how inclusive it will be, I think that's for time to tell. It's, uh, the, the politics is not clean, it's not uh, quick, and certainly it's a zero sum. That has to change, and that's where everybody is trying to work on. Well, what, what about the threat that ISIS is posing right now? The integrity of the state is in question. That's how the threat we're taking it. We're not looking at it likely. The ramification of that on Jordan and Saudi Arabia is, uh, I mean, uh, can, I mean, we, we, you called it intermediate, I would say sooner than intermediate. I would say it's a sh short-term situation. We're looking at changing the map of the region within 18 to two years. That's how soon it is. Yes, I, I would agree with that. I, I actually think that as we take thank a, you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, as we as we take a look at the situation in Iraq and and on the ground, what I deeply hope is that the, the government that is created will actually be capable of governing Iraq. I worry, um, and I worry very much because the government of Iraq has been losing control of parts of Iraq. 
uh, frankly, since about October of last year, when we first saw the Islamic State actually uh, enter into Mosul uh, and silence uh, journalists by assassinating them so that the Western media and the local media did not really have full situational awareness of what was going on. The reason I bring this up is that I think that we as Americans do want uh, to go back to tools of state in a region where indeed we hope tools of state will work. Uh, but we may be in a situation where uh, the United States needs to find ways to engage social leaders, tribal leaders, uh, local uh, communities in order to stop the spread of ISIS and create the conditions in which over the longer term a government of Iraq, should it be inclusive uh, and should it be able to regain territory, can actually govern. I don't think, though, that Americans have fully digested the idea that as soon as we get a government of Iraq, and I hope it will indeed be soon, we do not actually get change on the ground. The drivers of change on the ground right now are, first of all, ISIS. Uh, and we have to consider them a player. I do not think they wish to negotiate. I think that they wish to fight because it is critical to their image uh, and to their ability to continue uh, the expansion of the Islamic State. Um, we have uh, players on the ground that include Iraqi uh, Shia militias that have returned from uh, Syria. We have Iranian forces on the ground. Uh, we have Russian pilots and Russian equipment. We definitely have a situation that is no longer in the box of a government. Kathleen, what do you think that uh, Iraq will stay Iraq as we know it today, or will it eventually break into three sort of separate places? One thing I have learned from long government service is whatever answer I give you, I will be wrong. So I choose not to answer that directly. I will say the risk is significant. I think well stated by the ambassador and Kim, we are at significant risk of Iraq falling into um, into a partitioned um, set of actors. We obviously have that, I think, already with the, with the Kurds. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I think you know, this is where the United States has to do its best to try to build back the state um, for all the reasons that have been laid out. But I think it is possible that will not succeed and we need to be thinking now about how you deal with the region. Again, we're, it's not just Iraq. This is about, at a minimum, Syria, Iraq, but well beyond that. You need to be thinking about it in that way and the borders may be more fluid than one would like. What do you think, Dr. Yeah, I, I, I fear that we're already entering almost a fragmentary position now, which already speaks to the, to the severity of, of what's going on. And I think you're already seeing um, the, the Kurdish uh, regional government taking advantage of, of this fragmentation. Uh, we have to understand that that has Im very important implications for Turkey, which is for a European and NATO watcher, I watch very closely any instability in Turkey because that has direct implications for NATO and for the United States. Uh, I, I grow increasingly concerned if the, uh, the both for Syria and uh, in Iraq, where the oil wealth is held is where the economic power and the longevity comes in here. And that what is so distressing about as we're seeing these gains in, in, the, in the economic power of both Iraq and Syria. So it's, it's deeply troubling. I hope we're not at that tipping point where things begin to slide to a point where it's very difficult. And I certainly hope uh, that the US power and influence working with the region can help do this, but to Kat's point on, on Syria, we cannot wait three years to do this. Facts on the ground change so much. This is the problem with, with our, our delay and our waiting and our hesitation to support those moderates in, in the Syrian 
uh, opposition that we could have helped, and I fear almost now it's too late. We waited too long, and this is the do strategic you, hesitancy is really a problem. You do believe that had we helped that moderate opposition, it might have made a difference there. Well, we know by not helping them what has happened, so that we can conclude. It may not have been. It may not have made an enormous difference. But I, I would have felt as if we would have tried to give this a chance. And to see President Assad uh, today, you know, the, the, the film of him, you know, the, the third time around, what happened to Mr. Assad must go. So we have to be very careful with our rhetoric if our instruments are not there to help support our rhetoric. You feel that way? I, I do actually feel that uh, the United States could have made a difference uh, in the crisis in Syria really and uh, through uh, last summer, through August uh, 2013, uh, by supporting uh, the moderate opposition. I would actually call your attention in particular to the moment at the end of 2012 and the beginning of 2013 when the Syrian regime had actually run out of manpower uh, and was completely dependent on aerial resupply for sustaining its forces. The reason I bring this up is that at that moment of weakness, uh, I do think that uh, a change in U.S. policy toward the uh, Syrian moderate opposition would have and could have made a huge military difference. The lesson I draw from this as a military historian uh, looking now at Iraq and Syria is that we need to understand that circumstances on the ground will create windows of opportunity that will go away. If, in fact, we see ISIS consolidating its state further uh, on the ground through military gains in Iraq, um, we will have much, much, much more to do uh, in order to displace it. Um, and it just brings home to me the urgency not of taking drastic military action, of sending hundreds of thousands of troops to Iraq or tens of thousands of troops to Iraq. But military situations are delicate uh, and action using military and diplomatic instruments can make a change only at certain times. We're in one of those periods and when ISIS actually consolidates, uh, we will have lost an opportunity and it will have gained one on us in the way that the Syrian regime was able to gain an opportunity created by delay to replenish its forces, uh, to rely on Iran and Hezbollah to reinforce, to reconfigure its command and control structure, and actually uh, to go not on the offensive in a way that definitively and decisively defeated the opposition, uh, but that was a major step change in its capabilities uh, over the span of six months. How does all this relate to the uh, talks with the Iran on trying to, trying to rein in their nuclear capabilities? Which influences what? It's all interconnected. Um, U.S.-Russia policy is heavily influenced by the desire to have a, a, a common approach to uh, Iran, has been heavily influenced by that. That certainly has affected, I think, and I'm not putting judgment on this, but it certainly affects how the U.S. has approached Russia vis-a-vis -vis Syria over the past several years. And so I guess the way I would say it is that the the highest priority, if you're just looking at actions, it appears that the highest priority for the United States in its Middle East policy really has been to get a, a negotiated way ahead on uh, Iranian nuclear capability. Um, and for that goal, other goals were tempered. Um, and certainly Syria, I think, is one of those where the U.S. chose not to push Russia as hard as it might otherwise because of Iran. Um, I think the going forward, let me first say on Syria, just I want to comment on, on the same point that Heather and Kim commented on. Um, I, I think I would just frame this going forward as chances are low, risks are there, 
but as I think they both well said, that, you know, we've seen the outcome of the other approach and we need to invest ourselves a little bit in a different kind of outcome. And as I said, I think if we keep the goals modest, which are still great, which is to get ourselves to a ceasefire, to get some form of governance back into Syria, some ability for the international community to provide aid, some ability to get the moderates strengthened, a little bit of battlefield capability for them to help to persuade Assad to the table. Um, that may be all we can do, but that alone is better than where we are today and will help. Um, on Iran, Iran's a key piece of that outcome. It's a key piece of the outcome on Iraq. And of course, we don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons. So we want to continue on the path uh, with Iran itself, with Russia and other actors, the Gulf in particular, to get the Iranians to be a responsible actor to the extent that we can inside the region. Let's go to the, uh, to the audience here. Here's one right here. Tell us who you Hi, are, please. My name is Bassam. I'm a former Syrian diplomat. I just want to talk about ISIS. I think the media here, they over-exaggerate of ISIS in Syria and in Iraq. In a sense, in Iraq, what's going on is Sunni revolution, anti the Shia control, and ISIS is a small part of the big revolution, big Sunni revolution, anti the Maliki. And when you talk with any leader of the tribes who are well connected to the US government, they will tell you that we are willing and will fight ISIS when we have our rights back from the government, political reconciliation. When you talk about Syria, Six weeks before their resort fallen into ISIS, the group of Syrian, free Syrian army, they met American officials. And they gave them what they need in order to cut the roots of that ISIS used between Iraq and Syria, and the Americans said no. And the ISIS, when went to their resort, they spent for a week, every day, $1 million to give free food for the people. So they didn't go by force, they, could, they went by money, because people, they don't think. My point is that the ISIS in Syria doesn't have the social network that protects it, but at the same time, there's no other side to support the moderate. In Iraq, it's the opposite side, the Sunni are majority, ISIS taking the lead in the media, by Twitter, by social media, whatever. And the people are, both people are looking for U.S. to get support. Thank you very much. Is there a question? Throw that to Kim. <laughs> Kim. I, I think that as a framing issue, uh, we need to understand that ISIS is a fragment of the global Al-Qaeda movement, uh, which has been in a struggle, uh, a fitna, um, as uh, we have seen essentially two franchises of Al-Qaeda, uh, the former Al-Qaeda in Iraq, now reflagged as ISIS, now reflagged as the Islamic Caliphate, um, and uh, Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria compete uh, not only militarily inside of Syria, but compete with one another about which vision of Islamic revolution uh, is actually the correct vision. Uh, so what we are watching here is a competition uh, between uh, ISIS, uh, an heir to Zarqawi, uh, thinking that, in fact, the right way to create an Islamic state is by force and by conquest, uh, by accelerating sectarian war, uh, and by creating political structures soonest. Whereas you have in Jabhat al-Nusra uh, a very different idea, Zawahiri's idea, that, in fact, we need to have a, an approach that is slower, that waits for uh, the people to accept the Islamic revolution, and that will become the groundwork of the global insurgency that is Al-Qaeda. As a result, when we look at groups such as Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria, we actually see that they are better embedded into the social structure and social fabric of Syria, whether we're looking in uh, Aleppo, for example, uh, is a, a great example, uh, or whether we're looking in, in Western Syria. They embed themselves in existing social structures. Uh, they work uh, through existing governing bodies that they then fund, that they then uh, appoint their people to, and it is a much more gradual and insidious revolution. I think we need to be aware that we have these two different visions of revolution going on, and frankly, both now 
have had some success. Uh, and so one of the most dangerous outcomes that I see is that we can find ourselves in a situation uh, whereby we, we def defeat ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra comes in, or we uh, see Jabhat al-Nusra lose its capacity and ISIS comes up, or worse yet, that we actually see them violently competing uh, to harm the United States, Western powers, and uh, lay the, the mantle of global leadership uh, before them. That's a dangerous situation, but I'm afraid it's one that we have to uh, recognize and cope with. All right, how about right here? Ed Berger, let me indulge in a bit of heresy. We've toppled, we have either directly or indirectly had a hand in toppling a number of leaders over the last several years. One can argue that, in fact, in each case, that has led to a vacuum of power. And in the sense of informing our judgments in the future, should we reconsider this issue of leaving the despots in place for the purpose of revoiding the vacuums of power? That's a very interesting question. <laughs> Who, Who would like to ask, ask well, I'll, answer I'll, it? I'll start. I mean, there's no winning on that one. Um, I'll start. I, I think um, every country situation is its own context. So I don't think there's an answer to that that is global. What I would say is the United States has has always maintained, however articulated differently by, from administration to administration, as a national interest, um, some form of uh, values. Um, for some administrations, it's a very activist approach, um, let's just say, in terms of spreading democracy or spreading universal values. But And in some, it's more muted. But it's there, and it's part of who we are as a nation. And it's part of what makes us great, is that we have a fundamental belief about um, you know, human rights and uh, rule of law and the role of the individual in society. I don't think the United States of America should give that up. Now, the question is, how do you weigh that in a specific context against, let's just call it generally, security concerns um, with regard to how the United States interacts in a region? Um, and I think that's something that is being struggled with. It's been struggled with in every administration I can think of. I think Egypt uh, probably is the clearest example where we have struggled with that most recently, which resulted, in my opinion, in a pretty muddled uh, way ahead, which is we don't quite know We've, we've essentially said security matters the most, but we're going to, you know, we're going to talk about the human rights piece, but we're not, you know, we're not quite sure which of these. But I would say, generally speaking, I don't agree in this administration. The United States has been a party to toppling um, governments. Um, we certainly haven't been activist on that role, um, with the exception, perhaps, of support in Libya. Uh, but I do think it's fair to say that we work in each of these cases in the United States, we've been working on how do you exactly balance these interests that are fundamental when they compete. And my view is security typically has been winning out. Right over here. Uh, Nick Farmer, could the panel speak to uh, how Putin sees Russia's interest in this area and whether there's any likelihood that Russia would like to cooperate with the US or whether, in fact, because of its oil and gas interests and others, it would like to see the, the U.S. continually bogged down with the nuclear issue in Iran, with Syria, with Hezbollah, with Hamas, and so forth. Very good question. Heather, one or two. Thank you. Um, well, we need to take Vladimir Putin at his word. And he's been messaging to us that he, his vision for Russia and the neighborhood is what he calls Novorossiya, New Russia. That's, but the concept is not new. It's actually 15th century Russia that extends uh, Ukraine, Moldova, some could even argue you know, back up to the Baltic states and elsewhere. This gets back to, I think, again, P Putin's profound refutation of the post-Cold War settlement, if you will. Um, and he would like to recreate a Eurasia, a Eurasia Union. It's not a, a union like we think of the European Union of independent states, but they're ceding their sovereignty to a greater power. This is a union where Russia controls 
the Union and the, the countries that accede to it would support Russian objectives and, and aspirations. What is existential to President Putin and his regime is that he cannot have a different model on, in, on his border. So he cannot have a Ukraine that embraces the West, whether that's trade and his greatest fear, which uh, would be the, uh, his immediate neighbors, the former Soviet states, joining NATO. So he must prevent th this alternative model because his model, and this has been, uh, you know, as we've been all watching events in Ukraine, I think we have underappreciated the, cons the domestic consolidation that Putin has in his own country. We have not seen the control of media and the crackdown on, on opposition since some of the, 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 the deepest days of the Cold War. This is truly a regime that is now taking complete control uh, of, of, the, of society. And uh, now he was able to do that using very powerful nationalistic themes. And that was really, so he could not lose Ukraine. And when Ukraine decided, uh, when Yanukovych fled, the former president, and Ukraine was going to join the West, was going to sign on to this trade agreement with the European Union, it was a complete failure of his own policy of, of making sure, preventing these states from joining the West. So how do you, how do you avoid a strategic loss to try to take a tactical victory. And the tactical victory was Crimea. It happened rapidly. Uh, there was no resistance to it. And quite frankly, it all shocked us. I think it even shocked some of Putin's closest uh, advisors that he actually went so far to annex it. I always use the word Anschluss because I want that historical resonance that this was, uh, this is exactly for the same purpose, right? The protection of ethnic Russians wherever they live. Well, that's a powerful message to Estonia and Latvia that have uh, 35, 40 percent ethnic Russian uh, populations within their countries. So he got Crimea. And that was a success in his view. And he, his popularity increased dramatically. And even though sanctions and the markets didn't like it, this was OK. And everyone's very popular. But then he, he took a tactical misstep. Supporting these pro-Russian separatists, he created a problem that did not exist in eastern Ukraine. Yes, there was great sympathy for uh, Russia, but they didn't want to separate from themselves. They, they want to be part of Ukraine, but they do want to have a, a stronger Russian identity. This conflict began by support of these separatists, and now this thing has spun out of everyone's control, and we see what happens today. I predict, um, and I hope I'm really wrong, uh, I predict a prolonged period of instability in this region. We are seeing asymmetrical and hybrid warfare that should concern us greatly. The cyber warfare, the information warfare, we have not seen this type for a very long time, and we don't have a very good response to it. Mr. Putin has changed the entire security environment in that region. It has reawoken NATO. NATO is going to take a more robust role, and the U.S. is going to be a part of that. So while we're dealing with extraordinary events in the Middle East, we cannot lose sight of this instability. This isn't going away. I wish it was, uh, but it's not. And we're going to have to be very strong and purposeful in dealing, because Mr. Putin's not going anywhere either on oil and gas. And, and I don't know what today's, the price of oil and gas is today, but it's probably 115. Uh, he can sustain himself for quite a long time. This regime can sustain. So I'm, I'm extremely concerned. This is a very, this is again, getting back to Sykes-Pico. This is re, this is saying, this is not, I don't accept the system that has been forced upon me. I'm going to change it. And we can either allow him to do that or fight for the system. System, and that's going to take a lot of resolve. Would you like to add anything? To no, that? I think that's just right. I, yeah. I agree. Great. Thank well, you. folks, I think we've probably come to the uh, end here. And uh, it's always good when we still have people ask, uh, wanting yes. to ask questions when we're at the end. That yes. means that uh, we managed to hold your interest <laughs> this far. I want to thank this just extraordinary panel that we had today. And thank you all for coming.